Good morning. This morning's scripture is 2 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Well, today, I don't know if that's coming out. Yes, okay. Today we start our new series in 2 Corinthians. And um, I want to start with the slide of what our theme verse is going to be. And the theme of 2 Corinthians is really identity in action. You know, we're going to begin to, if we're Christ followers and if we find our identity in him, then how do we walk that out in our daily life? And Paul is very intimate. This is one of the most intimate books that Paul wrote, that he talks about his struggle internally and externally, and he's very affectionate through this letter, and we have get some amazing passages of our identity in Jesus Christ. And so this is going to be our verse, and so let's say it together, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's our theme for 2 Corinthians, and we'll keep coming back to that. But today we're going to look at how did he even end up writing 2 Corinthians? I thought, he, you know, 1 Corinthians was enough. <laughs> well, so I guess it wasn't. So he wrote 2 Corinthians, and I, I've titled this, comfort through the uncomfortable. All humans struggle with the question of suffering. We ask questions such as, why is this happening to me? I cannot answer that question and neither can you. But our Heavenly Father knows evil, pain, suffering, and death itself is not normal, but it is abnormal because of sin. This is not to be brushed aside or handled in some glib or trivial explanation. For there is hope, practical provision, and tangible comfort during the seemingly chaotic world we live in. One truth and anchor that is crucial for us is that God is good. We need his goodness. As the psalmist said in 73.28, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all his works. And so Paul is going to share with these Corinthians. And how did this end up happening? Well, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians while he was in Ephesus. And then he planned to go to Jerusalem and he planned to travel and he heard from Timothy that the Corinthians were making a mess of things. They were really having problems. And they were 
dividing and they were struggling with sexual immorality and they were struggling with a lot of issues and it troubled him deeply. And so what he did was he sent another letter and we don't have that letter. He actually talks about that letter in 2 Corinthians 3 for he says, for this very thing I wrote to you so that when I came, I would have not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in, in you that all my joy would be the joy of you all. And so he writes this letter to them, and more than likely, Titus delivered it to them, and it's kind of straightened them out. Obviously, through the nature of 2 Corinthians, this letter was probably more forthright than 1 Corinthians, if you can imagine. He really laid it all into him. And what happened was Paul had not heard back from Titus, and so Paul had to start his journey. But he was very fretted about this. But finally, he, has, he gets word while he's in Philippi in Macedonia, he gets word from Titus that they've repented. He gets word that they're beginning to understand their new creation in Christ, and therefore, in A.D. 56, he writes 2 Corinthians. He writes, based off of their response of repenting, he goes, okay, so here's how we're going to live. Here's how we're going to live together. And he lays that out in 2 Corinthians, and it is an amazing book about the life of the believer in their new creation. And so he writes this to them, and he gives this wonderful letter to them. And of course, he opens with a greeting. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of Corinth, which to the church of God, which is in Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. And he always greets, he typically starts his letters this way, but I think it's important because Paul is saying immediately, what is his identity? And I think that's important. I think that as Christ followers, we need to be more concerned with identifying ourselves with being in Christ than anything else. And so Paul here says, I'm in Christ. I'm an apostle of Christ. You remember, Jesus came to him and confronted him on the road to Damascus, and his life changed. His complete life changed, and he's talking about that. But also, it's by the will of God. None of us becomes in Christ because of our own wills. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. We must be born again. And Paul is re-emphasizing that and saying, by the will of God, I wrote to you. By the will of God, I'm traveling. By the will of God, I'm sharing this gospel message that I so desperately needed. And he has relationship. He, he, Paul picked up relationships as he was journeying, like Titus and Timothy and Prisca and Aquila and Philemon. He picked up these amazing relationships, and he'll talk about that in the book, about how we walk out our relationships, and we also get peace. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. We have unmerited favor, and we have peace with God. Not through anything that we have done, but through the sacrificial blood of Jesus it's through what Christ has done we have peace with God. I don't have to fret over my salvation. If I've trusted in Christ, I can have full, confident assurance in Jesus. And that's important. That's a theme that he's going to capture here in 2 Corinthians. He's going to help us get more rooted in our assurance. And the rooting of your assurance is tied to your identity in Christ, not your activity. It's tied to your identity your, your activity comes out of your identity. That is so important. That is so important as we go through suffering and trial. You're not going to fret your way through it. You're not going to work your way through it. It's God who's going to carry you through this, through your identity in Christ. And so Paul works through this beautiful passage. Listen to what he says here. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He's the Father of mercies. We don't deserve mercy, but he gives us mercy. He gives us mercy. God is a giver. He gives mercy. He's a Father of mercy. 
That's so important for our identity. Many of us don't view God, maybe because we came from a broken childhood, maybe because we view our worldview through news or whatever is happening in our lives or the suffering that we're going through, but we have to come back to this truth that the Father of all mercies, he's merciful and he's the God of all comfort, emphasizing all. Comfort and mercy flow through who God is. And that's so important. That, that is vital to our understanding of who we are in Christ. The word comfort, he'll use 10 times. Okay, so he'll use this word, actually 11 verses, pretty amazing. He'll use the word comfort 10 times. And it's the word we get for parakleto, which is a word for the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. It's a word we get for Jesus that comes alongside. He's a comforter. And here the Father is defined as comforter. He is a comforter. It means coming alongside an advocate, coming to the aid, or strengthening. And he actually calls us to comfort each other through the comfort of God. And so Paul here is going to emphasize this for us, that as we are in our identity in Christ, we serve the comforter who brings comfort, and then we give comfort. And that's essential for us to grapple. In fact, in, in John 14, 16, it says this. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, word for comforter, that he may be with you forever. Another comforter, a comforter. So what we see here is as we dig into the scripture, we see the triune nature of God. He is a God of all mercy and he is a God of all comfort. And we are rooted in him. What an amazing thing. All of this has originated from God. That's important. Comfort doesn't originate from us. It's not a feeling. It, come, it came from God. It was his idea. And it's tangible. There's tangible resources and practical help. And I think that's important for us to understand. As believers, we don't live in pie-in-the-sky theory. We live in the trenches. And there's real practical, tangible help for us. It's not just we're in books and all of that, even though theology is wonderful, but theology is meant to be lived out. And so we live out and practice who we are in Christ. We do not celebrate suffering or try to explain it away. I think that's important. We don't explain or trivialize suffering. It's not something we just go, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. It wasn't like it was wonderful that the Son of God had to die. It wasn't like it felt pleasant and we don't try to explain it away, then what? Then what do we do? Well, in Romans 8, 26 through 28, 26 through 28 says this, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for us. He intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God. Suffering, yes. Evil, yes. Joseph's brothers meant it for evil, but God turned it to good. I don't fully understand that, but I believe it to those who are called according to his purpose, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is for people in Christ. Okay, this isn't just a blanket thing. This is for those in Christ. He's talking about us in Christ and our new identity. That's important for us to understand. In fact, if we're talking to someone that doesn't know Jesus, we need to bring them to the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. We need to help them understand that suffering is an evil thing and then we need to bring them to their own sin so that they might repent and find mercy. And so Paul is going to give us three reasons for suffering. 
He's going to give us three reasons. He doesn't explain it away. He doesn't explain everything. He doesn't exhaust it. But he does give us three reasons. And here's what he says. He says, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So the first one is suffering brings a way to comfort others. Suffering brings a way to comfort others. It's, God doesn't waste what you're going through. It doesn't mean he's not concerned, but he wants to, to, in the midst of what you're going through, for you to be able to comfort others and for you to come alongside people that are struggling and bring comfort. That's so important, and Paul talks about that. For instance, when Paul was struggling, Titus comforted him. Priscilla and Aquila comforted him. You know, when he was in jail, Timothy comforted him. When Timothy was away from him, he, he talked about he needs comfort. And so Paul here is saying that that's vital to us as believers to begin to see that part of our mission is to bring comfort to each other. Just like the Holy Spirit brings comfort to us. To us. We're not supposed to hoard our comfort. We're supposed to give it away. We're supposed to give our comfort because we've received comfort. And that's, that's vital for us to understand. Paul also uses this word affliction. It's the same word we get for tribu tribulation. It's the same word we get for the tribulation. In fact, if you look up the great tribulation, it would be the same root meaning. It can be the great tribulation. It can be normal tribulation. Paul will actually talk about tribulation that all of us experience. He'll talk about tribulation that comes because I'm a Christ follower. And he'll talk about tribulation that comes because I'm completely identifying with Christ and someone is targeting me and trying to tear me apart or trying to kill me or trying to persecute me. And we need to understand those distinctions because often we say, I'm under attack. Well, you might be under attack for your own folly. You might be under attack just because we know, or you might be suffering because we're just normal sin. Or there is suffering that comes because you're a Christ follower. I'm a Christ follower, I'm at work, and I'm targeted and I'm fired because I'm a Christ follower. That's persecution. That's actual persecution. So Paul talks about that, this tribulation that comes. Comfort, comfort, the comfort that we get does unlock some mystery of the suffering. We as sufferers put flesh on it. When we bring comfort to people, it does unlock some level of that mystery. It doesn't exhaust it, but it is important for us to step into that. We bring comfort. Suffering as a Christ follower is not punishment from God. It's an opportunity to share in who he is. That's important. A lot of us play a victim mentality. It is a privilege to suffer for Christ. Because as I suffer for Christ, nothing gives me a closeness of my identity than that. Than that very thing. And if you listen to people that talk from other countries who actually suffer, often they don't pray that the suffering would be relieved. They pray that they would be faithful to the Lord. Jesus promised that. He said in Matthew 10, 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. If it's true of him, it'll be true of us. They persecuted him. We will be persecuted. But here's the wonderful thing. It says, who comforts us in all our affliction will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffered. And there's a thought that comes across here. 
as Paul works through these verses is God will not abandon you. We will face trials, suffering, and mistreatment because of our identification with Jesus. But it is for the sake of his glory and the sake of the church. There's something powerful about that. The second thing that suffering keeps me from doing is it keeps me from trusting in self. It keeps me from trusting in myself. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So suffering frees me from the tyranny of me. It frees me to trust God. It frees me to receive comfort from other people and to not be in control and be in charge. And there's a level and an understanding of that that brings of the gospel and God's care. And if the longer I trust in myself, the more I'm pushing that away. And so even Paul here is talking about being pressed beyond what he could handle. It literally means there is no exit. There's no exit. Can you imagine being in a room? I can. It's called a panic room. We were going to go to a panic room in our staff meeting, and I thought, do not put me in a panic room. Because <laughs> you are going to see panic. You can't get out. And what Paul is saying here is, I cannot fix this. I can't figure it out. Imagine that for a second, the humility of Paul sharing that. Paul is a trained Pharisee who is used to figuring things out. He's a brilliant person. He's incredibly gifted. But Paul cannot fix Paul. Only the Lord can. And so Paul says that. Is God even good when I can't figure it out? And that's something that's really going to be a challenge for us. And I think it's at the heart of the gospel. And I think it's also at the heart of the scheme of the enemy to cast a shadow on the goodness of God in your life. Because if you start questioning the goodness of God, you start retreating. And it throws you into a mess. And you begin to try to fix things. And you begin to fret. And it just builds up, and it builds up, and it builds up in your life. And maybe you can identify with that, but maybe I'm the only person up here that struggles with that. But that's real. That's real. And we have the gospel, and we can step into that, like he says, for their salvation into people, into their fretting, and bring the goodness of God. Because we've experienced it. Paul even says, we despaired of our life. It's the thought there is that my psyche was fragmented. My psyche was fragmented. Does that not speak of depression? What Paul is saying there is, I was, I was actually overwhelmed with my very life. Now, that's even more vulnerable of Paul to share. Because what Paul is saying there is, I'm sinful and I'm susceptible. I struggle. That to me gives me incredible hope. Because is God good even when I'm in despair? Think about it. Is God good even when I'm at my end? Can, he, can, can God find me there? Well, if we believe that we're new creatures, we have to say yes. And that's where the gospel becomes really applicable in our lives. That's where it crosses theory and comes out of theological books and works out in here. And moves me here. 
And our world is going to need this more and more and more. And if you're comforted, comforted through this, then you are able to give others comfort through this. And then they're going to see a body comforting one another through this intensity. And that's what Paul is sharing here. And maybe some of you look at me perplexed because like, wow, did he really say that? I want to encourage us to plunge the depths of that and find the goodness of God in the hardest places. Because that's where the power is. And God can, if the gospel isn't good there, then the gospel isn't good. It has to be good there. There has to be a new creation there. The, wor the work of God, the Holy Spirit needs to find me there. I can't fix it. I'm pressed. There's no exit. But can the word of God, can Christ be my sufficiency there? Yes. Is God, God good even there? And I want to encourage you that the place to come out of a place like that, and I know it because I've been there, is to come back to the cross. We as a body at Westbrook will have to stick really close to the cross because that's where our power is. That's where the power to overcome is. And that's why Paul says this, but God who raises the dead. He inserts the power of the resurrection and the heart of the gospel. He brings them back to the heart of the gospel because it can be despairing to go, wow, I'm really struggling and I'm overwhelmed and I'm overwhelmed with my thoughts and I don't know what to do and people are looking at me and people are with me and they're speaking this and they're speaking that. Are you good, God? And then I look and I see the cross and I see the sufficiency of Christ and there's the goodness of God. There's the goodness of God. And Paul says, in God who raises the dead. There's a third thing that suffering helps us with. And it instructs us to give thanks. Suffering instructs us to give thanks. Listen to what Paul says. Who delivered us from such a great peril of death. And who will deliver us? He on whom we have set our hope. And he will deliver us yet. You also join in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the power of many. Giving thanks. Giving thanks. If you're struggling today with bitterness, which I have, with disappointment and doubts, and the goodness of God is clouded, Go back to thanksgiving. Give God thanks for what you do know. And what you do know is that you can go to the cross. That is definite. That is God's final declaration of it is finished. And that's where you can go with thanks. I'm going to say this because it, it, it might challenge us. It might even bristle you a little bit. But attitude is a choice. It's not a feeling. Don't wait for the feeling. The feeling may never come. Remember, suffering's tough. Your feelings might be eternity lagged. But an attitude is a choice. And Paul is saying as a new creature, I have a different attitude. I'm giving thanks to God. He will deliver me. That's not happy, clappy thinking. It's rooted in the sufficiency of Christ. As we close here, I want to give a few pieces of application. And I'm going to warn you, they're going to be counterintuitive. They're not going to come natural, and they're going to be tough. And the first one is, forget your issue. Pour comfort into someone else. Forget your issue and pour comfort into someone else. What? Forget my issue? Well, you can't fix it anyways. Forget your issue and pour comfort into someone else and find the goodness of God. Because you will. 
He who, gains, he who wants to lose his life, he who wants to gain his life loses his life. And he who loses his life for my sake gains it. The second one, surrender and release. Give it to the Lord. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Surrender, release it, and give it to the Lord. And if you have to do it a million times, do it a million and one times. And then do it a million and one million two times. And just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Release it, surrender it, and give it to the Lord. And finally, give thanks instead of becoming bitter. Give thanks instead of becoming bitter. Give thanks instead of becoming bitter. Bitter is a horrible weapon in the hand of the enemy. And it will destroy you and everyone else will just pull away. It won't hurt other people. It will hurt you. Because the thief wants to steal and kill and destroy the goodness of God in your life. And if you give thanks and stick to the cross, he can't stand it. He hates that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your goodness. As we sing, you're a good, good father. You're a father of mercies and God of all comfort. I pray there be freedom today. I pray that you would work by your spirit in our hearts. I pray that we'd stick close to the cross this year, Lord. And we trust you to do your work in us, the work that we cannot do. In Jesus' name, amen.